allowed. Uh, great, so Rahul is now going to tell us about the top trim class of the Hodge bundle and the log showering of the modulized space of curves. Okay, so thank, thanks to Ravi for this invitation. And so this is supposed to be a fun talk. It's some things we're working on right now. So some of the, some, not all the results have been written down completely carefully, although I think most of the things I say are going to be true. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about lambda g on the modular space of curves. And I should say, maybe from the beginning, if I had to pick my favorite class on any space, it'd be lambda g on the modular space of curves. And uh, why we were doing the calculations and the directions that explored here have to do with some kind of new directions and thinking about it, and that's these log directions. So I will try to explain a little bit about that. And uh, so the, the, ta the work here is with uh, Sam Molcho and Johanna Schmidt and also this fellow here, ADM Cycles. So, uh, so to start, there's the delete Mumford moduli space of curves, which I won't say much about, but you're supposed to know something about that, I think. And uh, we're interested in the Hodge bundle and the Hodge bundle is this rank G bundle. So this is a rank G bundle. I hope I wrote it somewhere. Yes, rank G vector bundle on the moduli space of curves. And the fiber of the uh, vector bundle over curve is the space of a holomorphic differential. So the fancy way is it's pi lower star of the dualizing sheaf. So it's a rank G bundle. It's kind of basic bundle. And it has churn classes. These churn classes are normally denoted by lambda i, the ith churn classes. It has churn classes 1 to g. g is the top churn class. And you can think of them in various ways. You can think of them in terms of cohomology, or you can think of them in chow, or you can think of them in terms of tautological classes in chow or tautological cohomology. And more or less, you can pick however you want. It's the, the discussion we're going to talk about here. It doesn't matter so much. I think I wrote things mostly in chow. So the top churn class is this lambda g. And as I said, this is, uh, this is kind of an amazingly interesting class. And I wanted to, before I tell you what we're doing with it now, I wanted to say some things about why it's an interesting class. So the first one is it has these basic vanishing properties. And if you play with the moduli space of curves, uh, they're kind of important properties. So the first one is that square is 0. And uh, the second one is if I restrict lambda g to the boundary divisor of mg bar, the one that has a, a curve with a non-separating node, self-node, then it's also 0. And these are basic facts. They come from Mumford's identity, which is comes from Rothenick and Roch, and the second one, so the second one's even more basic. It just comes from the residue. The second uh, reason that lambda g appears a lot is it appears in the virtual fundamental class of the modular space of contracted maps, and this uh, this appears in various contexts. But for the for this talk, the most basic context is this one: is this DR cycle. And if you have never seen it before, I will say a little bit about this DR cycle. But if I take the simplest case where I have uh, put zeros, which is, means it's degree zero. So the picture of this moduli space is this picture, which is a very simple picture. It's just you take a curve and you map it to a point inside uh, this rubber. So it doesn't matter which point you want. And then the virtual class of the space is negative one to the g lambda g. So lambda g just comes there as somehow the very first virtual class in, uh, when I map to one dimensional targets. You can't avoid lambda g. And because of this, because it appeared here, it led to some kind of formulas. And these, this is now, it's kind of amazing to say, but it's almost two decades old, this stuff now. This lambda g formula tells you how to integrate against lambda g. And it's a spectacularly simple formula with just a binomial coefficient. And these are the cotangent lines. And this uh, connection with these constant maps in gromov witten theory, it led to predictions of these formulas that comes from the Virasara constraints and the proofs of the first proofs of these formulas came with playing with localization and then lambda g plays a role in that and somehow the in some sense the the full uh, implementation of all of these relations came in the study of the uh, kappa rings of compact type and so this is all pretty old stuff but the lambda g and gromov witten theory continues the most recent things related to lambda g are these lambda g surface theories so for example you can find this in Pierre Bousseau's work it's pretty recent he has a much fancier name for it the quantum trop tropical vertex but this lambda g plays has come a recurring role in gromov witten theory from the uh, fact that it, it arises in the excess bundle. So that's uh, the second chapter. The third way that lambda g arises in some sense basic geometry, it, it arises by the pullback of the universal zero section from the moduli space. It's, it, 
if you map the modular space of curves, the moduli space of uh, principal, principally polarized abelian varieties and use the zero section, then you'll get this uh, lambda g. I will say a little bit more about this, but it's kind of a third uh, way it's coming. So there's three different geometries there. So the goals here are to uh, tell you a little bit about lambda g. In my in the first part of the talk, I'm going to try to explain to you how it's a complex class. It's, it's, uh, it's not simple. I'll bound from below the complexity of this class. And then the second part is that I'll show that when I consider it in log chow, it's almost as simple as possible. So they're kind of opposite views, and that's somehow the point of the talk, these two opposite views. So I hope I'll be able to convince you of these two. And so the motivation, the principal motivations for the talk is this new way. It was, for me, it was very interesting because I said I've studied lambda g from many, many different perspectives. And this is really, this, what's going to come here is slightly different perspective, this, this log g. This is certainly new for me. Are you going to tell us what log chow is? Yeah, of course, yeah. Don't worry. So the motivations, the motivations are mostly log geometry. And here's some logs near my house or apartment. So that's the motivations. So the starting point in this discussion, so now the actual talk somehow starts. That was before it was just the introduction. The starting point is this beautiful formula over the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties. And uh, so here is AG, that's the moduli space. And I look at the universal abelian variety. And of course, I get a zero section. And I can ask for what is the cycle. The zero section is some physical cycle there, co-dimension G cycle, of course, because it's a zero section. And you could ask for what is what is this class in the in the chow of this uh, universal abelian variety. And the beautiful formula is that uh, this zero section is the power of a certain divisor class, the stated divisor. And it's given by this formula. And that's a formula in chow. And this is proven by Fourier Mukai. And the standard references is Denninger Mura. And it's uh, there's various treatments of this. If you want a treatment, I recommend in the more, more recent version of the book, uh, Complex Abelian Varieties by Birkenhack and Lange, there's a treatment of this. And you have to be careful about which, uh, I mean, how you normalize this data divisor, it's trivial along S. But anyway, this is a great formula. And it's kind of important for uh, a certain direction in, in the relation to the DR cycle, which I'll say. So this is the starting point. And you can pull this formula back via the Torelli map. So the, the Torelli map, if I take compact type curves, it maps the abelian varieties. And this universal abelian variety is Jacobian. And this, this is Jacobian of degree 0 uh, line bundles. That has a 0 section. And if I have a vector of integers that's summed to 0, that's supposed to give you my 0 and pole data, there's an obel jacobi map. And I can pull back the 0 section via the obel jacobi map. And that's, that gives the double ramification cycle on the compact type locus. And if you believe this formula, which I said you should since it's proven, uh, then that tells you that actually this double ramification cycle on the compact type locus is that the gth power of some divisor over g factorial, because it's just whatever you get by pulling back the theta divisor under the Abel Jacobi map. And you don't have to worry about what it is, because it was computed by Grushevsky and Zakharov. So this is completely explicit theory here. It tells you what this double ramification cycle is on the compact type locus in this beautiful form. And the one of the starting points is this question is, could such a formula hold over mg bar? And the simplest case you could say is, well, could we have some, so lambda g turns, as I said, is a double ramification cycle. It's kind of a, the simplest one. And you could say, could you have lambda g is t to the g over g factorial? Uh, could that hold in the chow ring of mg bar for some divisor that restricts to 0 over compact type? And why 0 over compact type? It's because this uh, grushevsky zarkov uh, zakharov ca calculation in this particular case gives t equals 0. So it would be the, exactly an extension, the simplest way to extend what is true here. And so that's a lot to ask. And the answer is no, not even in genus 2. So maybe we should look for a little bit less. And so the, the first uh, thing that be slightly less is just to be maybe you don't want to put all these restrictions on t. And maybe t to the g is a little bit restricted. Can we write uh, lambda g in the subalgebra of divisors? So we look for it. We define a subalgebra of divisors. So inside the Chow ring, we can look at all the, the uh, 
classes that are generated by divisors. That's a subring. That's a divide. This div ch star. I mean, by the the subalgebra generated by ch one. And the, then the question, the most basic question, is lambda g an element of this algebra? So that's a pretty pretty concrete question. And you could ask, oh, can we can we solve this question? Well, one way is you can do some examples. But so the theorem, the first theorem in this lecture, is that for all genus greater than or equal to three, lambda g is not in this. Uh, uh, is that generated by divisor? So this is the first kind of thing I'm saying that this, this class is slightly complicated. It's not possible to write it as a, a, an algebra of divisors. And so how do you prove that? The proof is pretty simple, except for one step. So let's see. Well, you can just start doing some calculations. You can check in genus two. In genus two, there's this basic equation. Actually, it comes from that Mumford formula. And you see that, that, that lambda two is a square. In fact, this is exactly in the right form except for the restriction to zero. But anyway, this shows that lambda two is in the subring generated by divisors in genus two. All right, so we can go to genus three and you can check that uh, lambda three is not in the subring of divisors, but there's something funny happens. Lambda three is in the subring of generized for, is the subring generated by divisors in three one. With, if, you, if you add a mark point, suddenly it falls in that subring generated divisors. I actually don't understand why this is true. Of course, it, we know it is true. And how we do these calculations is in principle, we know a lot about these tautological rings and chow rings. And, and for a low genus, you can do the calculation on a computer. And our friend who's doing this is this ADM cycles. That's the co-author uh, has been working pretty hard. And I should say, this is a great program. It was written, uh, there's a layer I think that was written by Aaron Pixton. And then on top of that, uh, that uh, Johanna Schmidt and um, Jason von Zelm wrote, and then there's some more layers, and it's readily available. You can download it. It's still in time. You can wrap it up and give it as a holiday present to your loved ones. I recommend it. So from using this program, you can calculate everything you want in genus three, and you can just figure this out. It's just a, in some sense, exercise for the program. And what that what that happens there, just to show you what happens, is that the entire ring of co-dimension three tautological classes is ranked 10 and the sub the subspace generated by divisors is rank nine and you don't expect in this case lambda three would have the uh, luck to fall in here that's kind of a low probability and in fact it doesn't so that's the why it's not there but it's but the funny thing is that in in this m31 this space is ranked 29 and the divisor subring is 28 but somehow miraculously lambda three does fall in there. And as I said, I would like to understand this without the computer. Uh, it, it is some somehow foreshadowing of, I, I feel it's some kind of foreshadowing of what's gonna happen later in this talk, all right? But there is something unexplained here. So, so we find here that uh, for lambda three is not, in, uh, is not generated by divisors for M3 bar, but it's obvious that you're not gonna be able to use this however reliable uh, ADM cycles, it's obviously not going to be able to prove a theorem like this because it's just get harder and harder calculation. So then there's a nice little boundary argument, which I, I give you here. But before we do that, for this, for our boundary argument, we need, we need the result for MG1. And we failed here. So actually you have to go to genus four before you get a useful uh, computational result that will be used for the, the theoretical part of the argument. You have to go all the way to genus four, and then it happens that uh, Lambda four is not in the ring of divisors of M41 bar. And that calculation is a much harder calculation. This is rank 191. And the divisorial algebra here is rank 102, 103, and it's not there. So this is our input for the theoretical part, is that lambda four is not in the ring of divisors on M41. Sorry, I guess I should put, it. anyway. I did say it here. Lambda four is not in the ring advice for M41 bar. And this requires a pretty more, much more complicated ADM cycles calculation. Okay, so that's our input. Somehow, maybe I should put a one here. I'm not sure. It's logically correct, but I should emphasize it's on one. Okay, so now that, that was the computer part to start. And then now we can, now once we have that, then we can use the theoretical argument. So for all the genus, for every genus higher than four, there's a boundary argument. So you start with, Assume genus is at least five. Then you suppose for contradiction that lambda g is in uh, lambda g is inside the subring of divisors on m g bar. And then that that implies, of course, that's in the subring of divisors for m g one because you can just pull back. 
And then there's a boundary map from uh, mg minus 1, 1 and m1, 2, where the point in question goes over here. So it's kind of the standard genus reducing boundary map where you have now you have a g minus 1 and a 1 component. And then we can restrict. And that, that's the whole idea here is that we have this lambda g on the one side and we have divisors on the other side. And then we can restrict to this divide to the uh, boundary. And on the one hand, we know how lambda g restricts. That's that's one of its charming properties. It restricts is lambda g minus one on the g minus one side and lambda one on the one side. And on the other hand, if it if it started out as a product of divisors, it's still a product of divisors on the on the boundary. And then the fact that this m one two is a very simple space. It's basically has you know rational pieces. So it means that there's no mixed divisors. So lambda g is actually in divisors on one side, divisors on the other side, pullback of lambda g. And then you can use some pushdown argument. So you have some kind of nice information about the pullback of lambda g here. It's inductive because lambda g minus one, then I can push down to the lambda g minus one, one. And to push that down in the place I want, I first multiply by a cotangent line and I get this relation that if I pull back, I pull back and I cup with a cotangent line on m12 and push down to the first factor, I get this lambda g minus one. And then if I use the, the fact that we know that this comes from divisors on one side and divisors on the other side, then I can show that actually this lambda g minus one is also in the divisorial ring. So the, this little boundary argument shows this implication that if lambda g is in uh, the, this divisorial part of mg1, then it then implies that lambda g minus one is indivisible part of mg minus one. So, and since we've already shown that this fails in genus four, it means that it must fail everywhere above it. So that's the proof. So, so this somehow shows some complexity of lambda g. It's a class you can't you can't make with divisors. Maybe you didn't expect you could make it, but you can't. But I think I missed something. Why wouldn't that argument have worked? on g equals four? Why do you have to start at g equals five? Why, do, why wouldn't that same argument relate g equals four to g equals three? Because g equals three, it is in this three one. That was this kind of accident. Maybe the real question is why do you need uh, the one point? Yeah, you need the one point because you need this, uh, you know, this, uh, if you start with one point in the recursive structure, when you take the boundary, you get a point. So there's the point hiding. If you want to do a boundary res restriction, if you start with no points and you restrict the boundary, you'll get a point there. And if you want a symmetric statement, you should start with a point. You can you could write this argument in various ways, but the fact of the matter is the induction is going to go through the boundary and the boundary is going to have a point there. So this, the cleanest way, if you want a nice statement like this in this box, that's why I put a box around it. Then it's just a nice symmetric statement. You need a point. And you could also there's a, you can also make prove some other results. That's not somehow the point of the I mean. You could also, you, maybe another question would be, what about lambda g on genus g with marked points? And then the fact is after genus five, they don't, that doesn't help either. This, this funny thing that happened genus three doesn't help. But anyway, the point is that lambda g, you cannot make it with divisor classes on mg bar. And I said, you might not have expected it uh, to, to happen anyway. Then you could say, all right, well, what about maybe, what about co-dimension two classes? And that's also false. This is a much harder calculation. But it turns out for all g greater than or equal to eight, lambda g is not in the subalgebra generated by co-dimension two class, one or two. And to do that, you basically use the same boundary argument, but the difficulty is the initial case, because of course it's going to start out being in this algebra. And the initial case you have to uh, check there, the, the first initial case is a much more difficult initial case. Uh, it has to go to, to genus, this lambda five is not in the subalgebra of M five one bar generated by co-dimension one and two cycles. This is the first time it fails. And this is a much more serious calculation. The subalgebra is rank, is rank uh, 1,314. And it lives in a space of 1,371. And uh, to check this, we have yeah, Mr. ADM cycles. And he worked 31 days. And in fact, by some great coincidence, the calculation finished this afternoon. Johannes was running it, and I was wondering whether it was going to finish in time for the talk or not. But uh, I'll make some comments about that. So it, it, the, this uh, this space where ADM cycles works, it starts out with 9,665 decorated strata, and uh, the actual it has to work in this linear algebra. And it's kind of complicated. I think it takes about roughly 
half an hour to do one to to measure the independence, so to speak, of one one stratum. And the the way that this can one of the things that comes out of this is this actually checks a new case of Pixton's conjecture, meaning that uh, if you believe Pixton's conjecture for uh, relations among tautological rings, this space co-dimension five and M five one that's how many additive uh, generators there are. For example, in the, if you use the, the basis, not the basis, the generators that Tom and I wrote in that paper, the decorated strata, that's how many there are. And if you impose all of Pixton's relations, Pixton's rela you get exactly this prediction, 1,314. That's how many, and, and that's what this uh, program does check after exactly one month of hard work. It's exactly right. It's the number is just exactly right. And uh, uh, how does it check it? Well, you, we don't know how to check the, this kind of statement in general, but we can check it if the rank is, if the uh, Poincaré duality holds in this case, and, and that's what it checks. It just checks that the rank of that Poincaré pairing exactly matches, and then that's one place when, when, that, when the Poincaré duality holds, then everything snaps together. There's Pixon's relations, and then that gives the, uh, that kills things, and the uh, Poincaré duality keeps them alive, and if they exactly match, then it solves the problem. So this does check a, a new case which uh, again, you may not have been uh, too worried about, but it's, uh, and that, so that's, a, so that's, a, uh, that, so this is the end of the complexity part of the talk, which is, you know, I, I didn't, I don't know exactly, it, our motivation was because there was some hope maybe from the uh, picture of the, of that theta equation that it might be simple. And the answer is it's not simple, lambda g is not simple. And, uh, you can imagine that the, so we prove it for these two cases. And you can imagine the obvious conjecture for fixed K, lambda G's in the subalgebra of Chow of MG bar generated by cycles up to co-dimension K only for finitely many G. That's a standard, that's the basic conjecture that's gotta be true basically. And we proved it for K equals one and two. Uh, I don't know how really to prove it in general K because you'd have to, I mean, you certainly this method doesn't work because of the, the method here basically is you have to find a case and you can prove it using that case you can prove it for higher ones but defining the case is not so easy but with chow do you mean tautological chow here actually in in this uh yeah in this this so here is the statement i wrote carefully it's not in the subalgebra this we actually you can actually prove the statement for any chow that's because you go to this g that's why this eight is here that uh, because at a certain point you can map Chow to cohomology, and at a certain point cohomology is all tautological. Co cohomology H four is all tautological. Oh, I see. So, so this is a little trick, and I, it would have got probably gone unnoticed, except Carol noticed this. You know, that uh, so in general, yeah, maybe you can formulate this however you want, but I think that however you formulate it, I would I believe it. And so the conclusion is lambda G is as complex as possible. And so. Do you always have this reduction set? So is it conjecture equivalent to there exists some G? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's the, that's right. You can write the, you can write the conjecture that way also, if you if you formulate it correctly. Yeah, that's that's correct. Once in every case, once it starts, then you have to be careful about where you want you want. Like for example, we need this marked point. When we write the paper, there'll be some there'll be some language about this, but it is correct. Yes, that if you gave me uh, one point in every from one point, you can get all the higher genus if that point is, ha is, is sitting in the right place. All right, so as I said, this, is, uh, this, is, this was part was in some sense just to set up the next part. The more interesting part of the talk is the simplicity and uh, that, uh, oh, I, made, so make two, I make two comments. I already said that this ADM cycles, when we, we do this, it proves two different, two new cases of Pixton's conjectures about relations and that's in these cases. Um, okay, and the other thing is I want to comment about Torelli. These claims, these complexity claims also bound the complexity of the, um, there's an extended zero section. If you look at the uh, compactifications of the moduli space of abelian varieties, and you can think about them via Alexeyev, and that's a second Voronoi, and as Olson has a, uh, some kind of slightly refined view of it, but it doesn't matter for what we're saying. If you look at this compactification, it turns out there's still a, a zero cycle, a zero section over the, the thing that's kind of like an abelian variety over that compactification. And you can ask about how complex that class is in the chow, the operational chow of that. And since there's a pullback map, any complexity you uh, find for lambda G on MG bar will bound this complexity from below. So in particular, 
it says that we say that uh, you can't write this class uh, in the algebra of divisors of the universal uh, abelian variety, nor can you write it in divisors in co-dimension two classes. And of course, you can conjecture you can't ever write it in, in terms of any finite amount. And in the case of the divisor case, that can be extracted by uh, some, um, some geometry that was proven in a paper of Grushevsky and Zakharov. I discussed this with Sam. But the co-dimension two thing, I think, is a new result for the abelian varieties. OK, so then we come to uh, the log part of the talk, which I think makes the, the direction more interesting. So the fir to first, to answer Jim's question, because I figured that he didn't know what log chow was. So I prepared this slide. But uh, so Thank what you. is log? What is log chow? And so that, that's already there's. I, I think people. There is some discussion of how you want to define it, and I tried. This is uh, some approach. So log chow. So first, what are we going to define the, the chow ring of? So we need to have a pair, and the, the simplest one is a non-singular variety. And of course, all of our non-singular varieties are actually going to be the lean Mumford stacks. But so we leave that aside. And then a nice normal crossings divisors. That's going to be the input. And the, it's not assumed to be strict normal crossings because that's not what we're going to have. I mean, MG for MG bar, it's not going to be like that. So the picture you should have in your mind is like this. There's some ambient nice variety X. And then so there's some uh, normal crossings divisor. It has some components. The components can have self-intersection. They can have these kind of intersections. Uh, just arbitrary normal crossings, not strict normal crossings. So when I have such a... Uh, uh, space, there's a basic notion of strata for, for this pair. And I'm not going to define it, but it's kind of obvious. And so here's the, here's the uh, picture. So I, now here's the example here. And I explained to you what the strata are by different colors. So there's like kind of a big stratum. And then there's the ones that uh, it's, I hope that's clear. So whenever anybody meets, it gets goes to a smaller stratum. All right. It's, it's a quasi project. It, this actually is, I, I corresponds to the uh, what we call strata of mg bar, the quasi-projective strata of mg bar. So this is so a stratum here is quasi-projective and non-singular, and the closure may be singular. So like if you take the blue, this quasi-projective blue one, uh, that's a nice quasi-projective stratum. And if I take its closure, unfortunately, it becomes singular. All right. What do you and mean by see... quasi-projective here? What? What do you mean by quasi-projective here? Like. If you're in the M stack, for example. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know. Let, if you if you're going to worry about that, let's say you're not in the M stack. Okay, so um, the closure may be singular, but I want to blow this thing up. This log, this log, the study of the log uh, uh, Chow is going to involve blowing up the space X, but I'm not going to allow myself arbitrary blowups. I'm going to have to, I'm basically allow myself blowing up these uh, strata. So technically, I want to define a simple blow up of this space. The simple blow up, this geometry, is a blow up on a non singular stratum closure. So I only allow myself blowing up. You can also do some fancier things about, but the, the simplest perspective is you only allow yourself to blow up non singular things. And uh, I want to blow up only non singular. Uh, sub varieties, which are closures of strata. So in this case, like here, I, I would only allow myself, for example, to blow up this blue thing. That's a nice smooth thing. Or I could blow up these points. Those are also non-singular. So I just keep, I can blow that up. And if I do blow that up, that's what I call a simple blow up. And then if I blow it, I, if I blow it up, I have some kind of nice feature. The, the space I get by blowing up, of course, this is still non-singular because I've blown up something non-singular. And then I have a divisor on the upst uh, divisor upstairs, which comes from strict transform of D, and then also the exceptional divisor of the blow up. And this object is uh, in the same world. So we can define this category B, X, D, and the objects are these uh, maps where this is the variety with the normal crossings divisor I started with. This is some other smooth variety with the normal crossings divisor. And this map is a composition of simple blowups. So what I'm allowed to do is take my, my uh, x with d, find these smooth strata, and blow them up. And I can, when I go, then I can go upstairs and do that again and again and again and again and again. That's all I can do, though. So I can just keep blowing up 
these these strata. So are there any questions about that? Does it eventually, can you get to a place where you don't have these self-intersections anymore, where you have a whatever, normal crossing, like the best normal crossing, I forget what you call that. No, you can't quite do that. I mean, you can do, you can, I mean, like if you have this thing, then you, you can have, then when you blow it up, it'll be like this and there'll be some exceptionals. Yeah, you won't have, you won't be able to get this off into this, the strict normal crossings. Right. You can improve situations that you're interested in. So the morphisms are diagrams. I think this is okay. Yeah, I think I think you, it would be simple. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know what you mean by is this this simple normal crossings? Yes. Okay. All right. So, I mean, blow it up again. Yeah, the two yeah, points. Yeah. And then it's. Uh... Yeah, you blow it up again. You get to a triangle. That's Go. that's oh, yeah, I guess that simple is, normal. I guess that's simple normal crossings. Yeah, maybe you can. The, um, the morphisms are diagrams where uh, the, uh, so these are already simple blow ups and then this, the other guy is also simple blow up. So all we're doing is simple blow ups. We're just taking our geometry and we do simple blow ups. So the, the definition of this log chow is it's the limit of this chow ring uh, over all of these simple blowups. So practically what that means a, a class here, to, to get a class here, you, you, I can give you a class by taking some kind of chain of simple blowups of my original geometry and picking any chow class there. And two of those things are equal if I can find some kind of, uh, so here's my the bottom XD. So to give, a, to give an element here, I do some kind of simple blowups. And then I put some chow class there. Sorry. And then maybe I do some more on some other way and I get some other chow class. And then how do I compare them to figure out whether they're equal? Well, then I can find some kind of common chain, some co common uh, parent above both of them and I can compare them there. So if they are equal there, then I consider them equal. So okay? the class does the class doesn't have to live on the original thing. It, no, no, it just that's has to live on exactly. some blow up. It has to live on okay. some blow up, and if you want to compare two, you have to find a common blow up that lives above both of them, and you compare them there. That's this limit process. Okay, so um, all right, so that's the that's the uh, log chow, and when you first see it. And I must say, I'm not very far from that. <laughs> when you first see it, you think there's a lot of blowups. And in some sense, that's true. But in, in some sense, it's not really true. Because every time you blow, there's only finitely many of these strata. And so there's really not so many choices for blowups. So of course, there's infinite. You keep, keep blowing. But there's a, there's a bigger thing called this kind of beach chow where you can blow up any possible subvariety. And that thing is huge. And compared to B chow, I mean, somehow there's the chow, if you have the space X with D, there's the chow, which is the smallest. And then that lives inside this log chow, which as I said, the first time you see it, you might think it's large, but it's actually not that big. And it, it sits inside another thing called B chow. B chow is the same definition, except you're allowed to do any blow up you want. So you don't care about the divisor. And what I was trying to say is that this kind of gap is kind of small compared to this gap, which is huge. I don't know if that's a helpful comment, but. So, so this has nothing to do with log, uh, with log geometry in the Martin It Wilson. does log, have, exactly, it has something to do with the whole motivation. Didn't you see the picture? Here it is. But I think Martin there has a kind of log, those are Swiss logs. I think Martin is thinking <laughs> about the kind of logs near Berkeley. Yeah, it does have something to do with log geometry. You can define this in it, exactly as something. In fact, the motivation, we'll, we'll just, yeah. Yes, it well, does. How about motific integration? I mean, this also has this sort of flavor of motific integration. Is there some way to phrase this using like maps of little infinitesimal arcs and all that stuff? I don't know. I haven't thought about such a connection. Okay, so, um, so and we're interested, then we're gonna be interested in this divisorial part of this log chow because that was the spirit of the previous discussion. 
And the, the, the divisorial part of log chow, the simplest, the, the most restrictive way of defining it is it's just a subalgebra generated by the boundary divisors. That means when I blow up, there's a well-defined notion of that divisor, pieces of those divisors. I'm only allowed to use those. So is it clear what this algebra is? It means that I get to do as many log blowups as I want, simple blowups, and then I get to take some divisors. And the divisors have to be pieces of that boundary, pieces of, of eventually what D is. So like in the, in, this would mean that in this example, the D has two pieces, so I throw those in, and then I blow up. I could make some more exceptionals. I get, I could just throw those things in. So it's kind of small, and this is a, um, so this is the, the smallest definition of this divisorial part, and uh, this should be viewed. The wise way to view this is this is kind of the combinatorial part of the cohomology because it's just given by. Well, is this the, is this thing um, kind of finite up to this div log? Because it seems like after a while. You, these blowups, maybe that's not important anyway, but. No, I think they can get, get it still gets infinite. If div log can, oh, finite up to div log. Yeah. Oh so, yeah, I think Sam knows something about that. That might be true. Yeah, that, that I think that might be true. That's a, yeah, that's an intelligent question. That might be true, but so, Sam would know something about that. I'm not sure. It's, it's certainly plausible. But so this is, but this div log thing is kind of a combinatorial. I said, I, I said actually, I was in the middle of my joke. Sean, the wise way to view it is is, is the it's the you view it as the combinatorial part, and by wise I mean that's what Jonathan Wise views it as. That because uh, it, it has kind of a combinatorial feel. You start with some kind of that this the geometry of this boundary is some combinatorial object. These the, that's what these the log guys love, uh, and and when you make it bigger by blowing up, you kind of enrich it a bit, and the, this is the whole. So that's the uh, so that's somehow the background. And I hope that's relatively clear. The the moral is that uh, if I take this quite quick summary, is that when I start out with this kind of geometry of a smooth variety with the normal crossings uh, divisor, that uh, there is this log chow which has to do with these kind of special blowups you're doing that respects the the boundary structure, and inside of log chow, which is big, is this uh, kind of combinatorial part which has to do with just uh, the classes of the divisors that you were you started with and the, and the divisors that you create. And the statement, so of course, the, the example we want is mg bar and the boundary of mg bar that's well known to be non-singular with normal crossings. So this is an example. Of course, the picture here is complicated as g gets higher, but then the main theorem that the simplicity is this lambda g lives in this combinatorial part. I mean, that's the, that's the, the, the statement that at lambda g is simple. It actually lives in just this combinatorial part. Uh, so this is in some sense, the opposite of the point of view for mg, for mg bar, that was the wrong way to look at the, to look at it in, in the chow of mg bar was kind of was wrong. It looks very complicated there, but the actual truth of the matter, it's, it should be viewed as kind of a simple class in this space. And this is the perspective from the, you know, when you say does have the, this, this, uh, does this have to do with log geometry? Uh, so let me try to say some small words about this, but I, it's not going to be very convincing. So someone like David Holmes or something like should say, should say it. But the idea there would be to try to try to lift. And in fact, the, some of the motivation was to understand that perspective. So where is this uh, beautiful formula? Yeah, if you want to try to lift this to all of mg bar, the first thing is you have to think about what you're going to do with this uh, uh, moduli of abelian varieties and the, uh, the idea that uh, Jonathan and David, Holmes and Sam would advance is you should replace that by some kind of log Picard scheme. And on the log Picard scheme, hopefully some version of this Fourier Mukai might work. And then the issue that uh, that David kind of made clear was that if that stuff works, there's not a chow group well-defined for this uh, log Picard scheme, but rather a log chow group in the form that I'm advancing. And then if that all, if all that stuff were true, then somehow the, such a formula would not hold on mg bar, but would hold only in, not hold in chow of mg bar, but in log chow of mg bar. So in some sense, this whole thing were, was motivated by this uh, log geometry. And what we find is that, so that's, this is, this might be viewed as some kind of shadow of that, that uh, picture, although that route has not been, has not been traversed. 
Okay, Raul, but, back to your first thing. If you, instead of taking divide, you, what was your original thing was that lambda G wasn't in the ring generated by divisors, right? Yes, yes, that's right, yes. What if you threw in strata? Because that seems kind of more like what you're doing here. You mean all strata? Yeah. But not, uh, not any, uh, um, because well, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's reasonable. Yeah. yeah, they become divisors, but you know, we're not so. So I don't know the answer. Certainly, our calculations don't show the answer to that question. But it's not the same thing because it looks like the same thing. Because I'm not saying push down. I know. You know so what, what it, mean, it would be more of the same thing if I push down. I'm not allowed to push down here. What it's I mean is, pull back. stratum. You know, yeah. you blow it up. It'll yes. live in there also as like a section, and now exactly, it'll be a section yeah, two divisors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's a reasonable question. We can try to investigate it. So, but it, yeah, it is the case that this 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 question is is uh, yeah. If if I were allowed to push down here, things would be much simpler. Yeah, I'll have to think about whether that's that's true. Okay, so anyway, what I want I want to say here is that, the, that from this log perspective, lambda g is simple as possible, and it's almost a combinatorial object. It is not the case that we can we kind of agree with this statement. In some sense, we disprove this statement, but there's some question about what that means because of you know one can wonder whether there exists whether this statement this exact statement here whether this statement holds in log chow, whether it's actually a G, whether it's a, a G power, whether it holds in log chow. And I th there's some question about what's that mean, but if you, the thing that we can disprove is that even this precise G power statement doesn't hold in log chow if you insist on this normalization. It's actually hard to prove that these formulas don't hold, <laughs> you know, that's a, uh, What's the ambiguity in the statement in log chow? It seems well defined in log chow, right? Or no, it's yeah. If you if you if you just put log here, um, this for some t in log in 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 the divisorial part, right? And you insist on this condition, which makes sense. Then this is false. Ah, great. But maybe but maybe you don't want such a strong normalization condition. Jonathan was complaining about it. I don't know. It, it, I'm just saying there is a little room in the door for something like this to come, but you have to loosen something. That's ah, great. And it, so kind of the lambda g though. You're just taking the lambda g to be. Oh yeah, that's a very that's a very good point. Is that why do I get to just take lambda g just pulled back? Because you're supposed to also, in these formulas, take log dr. But lambda g is the one class that is actually its pullback under log dr. This is a technical question, but it's a very important one. That this lambda g that that's a very special property of lambda g. It's not only is it the dr cycle downstairs, it's also the dr cycle upstairs. So that's a technical question, a very important one. Well, I, I was going to get to that at the end. So I wanted to explain the proof because this proof is all is um, pretty conceptual. I'm trying to give you a proof of the simplicity. Yeah. So this is the theorem. In some sense, the main positive theorem in this talk is that uh, lambda g is in this divisorial algebra. And as I said, this means that it's a kind of as simple as possible, almost a combinatorial object. How could we prove such a thing? And the proof has two steps. The first is a general result about some, uh, some geometry related to these uh, x with a normal crossings divisor and what we call these normally decorated strata classes. I'll explain that. And the second is Pixton's formula for lambda g. So this is a this is a formal step. Sorry, this step here is somehow purely formal. It's general, and this is very special for lambda g. We use the actual the actual form of Pixton's formula, not just that it not just that it exists, but the actual form of it. So we start with step one. So this is some general statement about uh, x and d. So we have x, a non-singular variety with a normal crossings divisor. And uh, we have this quasi-projective stratum and also its closure. And uh, if you don't like quasi project the word quasi-projective for delete Mumford stacks, just pretend you're in a variety. Actually, I don't know what the problem is, but. Uh, so um, this, uh, the, the strata, uh, the closure of a stratum may be singular. I even drew a picture for that. And then we want to take the normalization of it. 
I'm, kind of, I'm going to define you some classes. In fact, but I'm kind of define you with some tautological classes. If you like mg bar, this shouldn't be a surprise. That if you have this, if you have such a geometry, there's some natural tautological classes in that geometry. And those are defined to first order by the strata closures. Those are some tautological classes there. But we want something more. We want some normal bundles on that also. And to say what those normal bundles are, you have to be a little bit careful. That's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to be careful, which is usually a bad choice in a lecture. So we, we take these uh, closures, which may be singular, so we normalize them. And then when I normalize them, that carries a normal bundle because I fixed the self-intersections. And this, has a, this, this map from the normalization is an immersion, so that carries a normal bundle. And moreover, and this is the subtle point that's actually important, is that this normal bundle has a direct sum decomposition, uh, which has to do with the monodromies of the branches around it. So you know, if this were a strict normal crossings divisor, then the matter would be trivial because then, then the normal bundle would split in terms of line bundles because every divisor, every divisor which cuts it would give you a normal direction. But when you have some, something uh, unpleasant like this, then uh, at this point, of course, I want a higher dimensional version of this. Actually, I drew a diagram, I just remembered that. When, when you have a higher dimensional version of that kind of thing, then you can't separate the normal bundle into direct sums of line bundles because there could be monodromy in the cutting equation. I, I just remembered I drew a picture of that. I'll give, here it is. So here's the variety X, this D is my divisor, and this red is the self-intersection, which is stratum. But I imagine, and I can't draw this, but imagine that these two sh sheets that cut that have some monodromy in them. They're not sep globally separated. So, but the, what you can do is it always uh, splits into some uh, direct sum, which, which reflect the monodromy of the cutting sheets. So what, I don't know what the exactly the local sections of it. And, and then you get in what we, this, this notion of what's a normally decorated strata class. And that's, we take this uh, S tilde and we push forward any polynomial, uh, any product of polynomials where this is a polynomial in one of those factors. So you can't take any polynomial in the, uh, yeah. I don't know. I tried to explain it. Was it convincing? So if you, if you study the modular space of curves, this should be pretty, uh, pretty simple thing to understand. And the point is that the stratum has a normal bundle. It only, if you're gonna really define the normal bundle via the differential of the immersion, you should take, consider the normalization and uh, when you say immersion, you mean unramified, like immersion in the topological sense? Yes, the, the differentials, yes. That's right, yes. It's like this here, if we have this, this is my closed stratum, I just do that. And then this, this map, then this map has a, a nice normal bundle. And maybe you're not worried about that anyway. But then this map has a nice normal bundle and moreover that normal bundle breaks the direct sum and that direct, that direct sum decomposition has to do with precisely the monodromy of the sheets that are cutting it. So as I said, if it's a strict normal crossings, this, is, this stuff is not there. And so, uh, and so the, the general statement is if I take any normally decorated stratum class, it li lies in div log of this. So if I take, if I, this is kind of a criteria of how to, how to know you're in this uh, combinatorial part so first of all, any strata, any, any just, if you just take the closure of the stratum, that is in the combinatorial part. And the proof of that is almost what Sean says, you blow up that stratum. But there's, you know, there's some little tricks about that in the sense that maybe that stratum was singular, so you should have blown up some other strata first. And the second thing is that when you blow it up, this is the interesting part. It's not very interesting, but if you like intersection theory, so I blow this guy up, say so that's the stratum, I blow it up, but then I get a big exceptional divisor. And now how do I find the pullback of the class on this exceptional divisor? Excess intersection theory says that it's the, on the exceptional divisor, you're supposed to take a certain churn class, the churn class of the normal bundle divided by O of minus one. That's the class of the pullback. So you see that if you want to get that class, you better control the normal bundles. That's why you have to start thinking about normal bundles all the time. All right, so this is the, the general theorem is that if you, uh, if you, do this business here in the geometry, you consider these strata closures with these normal bundles. 
uh, with this restriction about monodromy I said, then actually every such class is in this uh, divisorial part. And the, the proof of this theorem is completely trivial when it's cut out transversely by dis distinct components. There's actually nothing to prove there. The interesting part is all about self-intersection and that's somewhat painful. And it's not my, uh, actually, I don't think we've really completed, completely written the proof of that. It's a little bit painful. Uh, but I said, I'll give you examples. A simple example is this one where I have a divisor that intersects uh, this uh, itself and you should imagine this is some complicated one where the sheets have monodromy. So it's not, so you can't, you can't distinguish the branches globally on the red self-intersection. And then, then the claim is that if I take the class of that uh, self-intersection and I pull it back so that this should be in divisorial logs, that must mean that I have to write it as a, as a intersection of divisors. I can't do it here because you can't, I only have one divisor D and it's not, I can't get, I can't get the red by intersecting D. So this, I ha if I'm going to succeed, I have to blow up. And it's clear what I'm gonna blow up. I'm gonna blow up E, what else could I blow up? Everything else is a divisor. So I blow up E, when I blow up, I'm sorry, whatever, I didn't name this S. I have to blow up S and when I blow up S, I get uh, this exceptional divisor, which is the P1 bundle over S. And the strict transform of D cuts it into two sections. And then the formula in this case says that if you wanna know what this guy is, it's uh, well, it's this thing. It's, uh, and these things are all in the divisorial algebra. That's the exceptional visor and the strict transform. So that's a little game you have to play. And then to prove this theorem, you have to uh, play that game in some kind of generality. But the issue here is all about this uh, uh, um, self-intersection. So it is true, maybe that's the comment of Jim's. The first one of the things you do is you blow it up so that things don't intersect each other locally. And then the problem with that is then you have to pull back and keep track of the uh, excess intersections. And I don't know, you get a headache, but anyway, I think this theorem is true. If you if you think it's not true, tell me. <laughs> but I think that it's it's also the case we haven't fully written down the proof of this. I think we, hadn't, we haven't fully written down most of the things in this talk. All right, so that's the abstract statement. And then how, what, how it fits perfectly with Pixton's formula is uh, that, uh, so I have to say a little bit about Pixton's formula. But it turns out the Pixens formula will put lambda g precisely in this in this in this uh, language. It's exactly this decorated strata class. For for the moduli space of curves, if we many of us have thought about it, that there are these strata, and when I say this decorated strata class, that means what I'm what I'm talking about is that I can only put in the normal directions. The normal directions are those cotangent lines at the node smoothers. They're the kind of node smooth and cotangent lines. Uh, I can't put any kappa classes or anything like that. I can, and for this decorated strata classes, only those cotangent lines. And moreover, I can only put them in a symmetric way. That's what this breaking up of this uh, uh, normal bundle into monodromy, meaning that if the graph has some symmetries, I can only put those cotangent lines that respect those symmetries. I can't do anything I want with those cotangent lines because I can't separate them. And it turns out that Pixens formula will, will give us the answer in precisely that form that'll prove the theorem. So I have to say a little bit about it, then I will stop if you haven't seen it. So Pixens formula is for the general DR cycle uh, and for any G and for any uh, data. And the way that formula looks is it's a sum over stable graphs. And uh, so what is a stable? Well, I don't know, should I say all this stuff? If I have a stable graph, I get some product of moduli spaces in the usual way. And uh, the total logical classes are given. If I have a graph, I can push forward cotangent lines on the points. I can push forward cotangent lines on the half edges and also kappa classes on the vertices. And that gives some kind of additive generators of the uh, total logical, the additive generators of total logical rings, not even multiplicative generators, additive generators. The linear span gives everything. And uh, if you want to read some kind of background on this, I put some references here. So for the formula, we're gonna sum over all of these stable graphs. But uh, the interesting part is this, this weight. So each stable graph, we sum over uh, all the weightings mod R. So the first interesting thing is there's an R that's a positive integer. And the weightings mod R are maps from the half edges of the stable graph to the set zero to r minus one, that's this r element set. 
and they have these conditions that you for each marking the uh, value of the weight function has to be equal ai mod r so this are, these are the elements of this vector and for each edge there's a balancing condition and for each vertex there's the balancing condition of the vertex so that's some uh, combinatorial thing you're supposed to do with the for each graph you have a, for for each graph there's a set a finite set of weightings mod r and the number of them is r to the betty number and so then we get actual definitions the definitions that matter in Pixton's formula. There's a, the first one is this uh, class P, G, D, R. And uh, so that's, we have a genus, we have uh, some dimension and there's this R and it's given by some explicit formula where I picked the degree D, the co-dimension D component of it. So this formula, if you haven't uh, seen it, it looks complicated. After a while, it starts looking pretty simple. So I don't know what to say about this formula, but there's not, uh, you have to sum over all stable graphs, you have to sum over all the weights. And then there's the standard automorphism factors. That's the to, to somehow correct for the number of uh, weights, weightings. And then the interesting part of the formula is the actual uh, tautological class. And there's a factor for the cotangent lines. There's no kappas. That's kind of important here, no kappas. And then there's cotangent lines. And the, this edge term comes with these weights here. And there's, there's various motivations for this. You'll have to ask Aaron for what the motivations are, but there's some compact type restriction that govern some aspects of the formula and then also some motivations from this classification theory. But that's the formula and, and it's almost the formula for the double ramification cycle, except for the fact there's an R. So there's no R in the double ramification cycle and that's taken away by uh, this polynomiality. The, so the claim, uh, the first claim is that uh, this class, the dependence on R is polynomial for all R sufficiently large enough. And this comes from some, this, uh, this Earhart theory. So there's a, this was, this was proven by Aaron and appears in some appendix of JPPZ, but it's, there's a, there's a, it's a theory of counting uh, over integral, summing over integral points on some polytopes and you make the polytopes bigger. And then the definition of the DR cycle is that uh, you should take the constant term of this polynomial after after you set R to infinity, you get the polynomial, then you take the constant term. And then the, the theorem, which was conjectured by Aaron and proven in this JPPZ paper, is this DR cycle is exactly uh, this class constructed by Aaron and co-dimension G. So it's just a formula for it. And this formula is explicit, meaning that if you uh, download ADM cycles, it'll give you the answer. Of course, if you pick some giant genus and things like that, it will, uh, it won't finish, but uh, for for uh, small numbers, it'll give us it'll just give it to you. So, what's the case for lambda g? So, lambda g, as I said, that's that's a special case where I have no markings. So, it's got to be simple. So, this it's a dr cycle with no uh, no markings, and that gives me lambda g. And here uh, is the uh, we can just apply this formula. And this was uh, in one in the paper. There were some examples put here. So those are diagrams from JPBZ. They were typeset by uh, Felix. Uh, I should say there's one funny story here about this is that I gave this talk in, uh, in Beijing in 2016 or something like that, maybe 17. And I put the slide up and there was a student afterwards that came to me and said that he had read the paper and uh, the statements were true. And the slide, everything was true except this last sign was wrong. And, uh, and I couldn't believe that guy, but it turned out that I went back to, to Zurich and I looked at the files and of course I didn't typeset it, Felix did it. Uh, and there's a program that made them. And the only thing I did was put the sign error in some cutting and pasting. The guy was right actually. So this is the correct sign. It was the last sign error. So I was exhausted to get all the signs right. But uh, so you, th this, is the, this is the expansions for Lambda G and you see something kind of remarkable. You see that uh, for example, that there's a, uh, all have all the graphs have loops. That's kind of fun. So some remarkable facts with this formula. This actually is sum over normally decorated strata classes. That's kind of important. That uh, if you look at so the way this formula, if you understand this formula, its output is a normally decorated strata class because all it has is, is size, no kappas. That's very important because we don't have those. This, those and it has the size. The size are coming always in this normal bundle piece. They, that's exactly the normal bundle. And moreover, why? what about this monodromy thing? Well, because 
they're coming in a way that respects all the automorphisms in the graph. You're not breaking anything there. So that's perfect. So that's the very first thing. That, or, that proves that fin actually finishes the proof of the theorem. The, but there's something more, which is actually the only, the only strata which appear are over delta naught. That means every graph here has a loop. And that's a kind of nice exercise. I don't think I explained it here. A kind of nice exercise to zeroth exercise in understanding what this formula means is to prove that uh, actually every graph you get is, has a loop. In fact, more than that, every edge of every graph is non-separated. It's maximally loopy. So lambda g lives in this maximally loopy space and loopy part of the, uh, and that, uh, yeah, that's a set, kind of separate story. That's maybe a different talk about that. Uh, so that, that finishes the proof of the theorem. We put these two things together. And so in some sense, the hard work of this is in this lambda g formula, that the, the, the first part is kind of soft work. Although, as I said, I don't think, I don't know, Sam's here. I don't think we've successfully written the full proof of this yet because of it's, it's kind of a headache with all the, every time I start thinking about it, I feel like I'm getting COVID. Uh, one question from Dimitri, which is what other yeah. DR cycles lie in the decorated strata algebra? Oh yeah, very good, Dimitri. That's a very good question because it's on the next slide. That's a very good question. We're not done yet. Similar arguments. <laughs> Here it is. That every DR cycle, uh, I claim by the same argument, by Pixon's formula, lies in this div log, except you have to make a small correction with div. That's why I underline it. You have to also have the cotangent lines because uh, you see in Pixon's formula, there's the cotangent lines. In our case with the lambda g, all the a's were zero, so we didn't have this term. But for the general DR cycle, you have those. So the statement for the general DR cycle here is that uh, if I view... If I view the DR cycle as a pullback, then it's in the divisorial part. There's some kind of static. Is that is that me? You know, I don't know. The, the the general DR cycle is when I pull it back, is in this divisorial part, which is what I call this combinatorial part, what, what Jonathan calls the combinatorial part, except for the fact that we have these cotangent lines. That's maybe slightly exits it. But you have to put those cotangent lines. But th the deeper question is this, maybe this is what Dimitri is asking. There's a finer class, which is the logarithmic DR cycle class. And I don't know whether people know about this stuff or not, but it's, we, we've been thinking about that a lot, is that the DR class kind of lives downstairs in MG bar, but in the log world, there's log stable maps. And you look at the log vertex, there's a class that lives above it. And that DR class actually lives in log chow. Maybe that's another way of explaining how the log connection, this log, this log uh, gromov witten theory gives a class not only an MG bar, but in this log chow. And there's, this is a finer class. It's actually a very important class. And it has the property it pushes forward to DR. And you could ask, is this also, is this finer class in, uh, in this log chow? So it should be underlined here too. And this class is not quite equal. And this is the, the, the difference between these two is a kind of ongoing study from various perspectives. So I put some names of people who are in this ongoing study about the difference between the DR cycle and the log DR cycle that we've been talking to here. So that's Tom and David Holmes and Drew, Jonathan Weiss and the three of us. So the answer, so the, the conjecture, which is, I mean, it's a, it's, I'm almost embarrassed in calling it a conjecture since it's very likely and maybe after this talk, some people in the audience would view this as a theorem is that this D, this logarithmic refinement lives in this uh, uh, divisorial part where I've put the cotangent lines. And, you know, some, maybe I just stop with some philosophical words, but why, there's some connection between all of these objects to like Abel Jacobi theory and things like that, but that's not really my motivation. If we think about this, if you look at just regular gromov witten theory, there's a localization formula that I proved with Tom. And if you use it for toric varieties, it gets a vertex and that vertex is for standard gromov witten theory, uh, cotangent lines and Hodge integrals. And there's a kind of a, 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 a big piece of work that goes after understanding what happens with that Hodge integral vertex. And, in dimension one, it leads to uh, explicit solutions and solutions of local curves. In dimension three, it's connected to uh, gromov witten DT. And there, there's some kind of whole, whole theory that develops from studying that vertex. And what this stuff is, is this kind of the logarithmic uh, analog of those vertices. So if, you, if you look at localization and log gromov witten theory, 
the analog of that Hodge integral vertex are these double ramification cycles and their analogs. Uh, double ramifications and they're, you know, in Hodge integrals, there's a number of Hodge integrals you get. It could be linear Hodge integral or quadratic Hodge integral or cubic Hodge integral. The DR cycle is like the linear Hodge integral. Then there's also the quadratic Hodge integral, which is like what we were jokingly called the double, double ramification cycle. And uh, then there's these higher analogs. And the one that controls them all from some perspective is this one. So it's kind of important to really understand that. And I would, I would say that we're close to understanding it from various perspectives, but uh, not complete. Um, is there anything more here? No, that's it. OK, I made it. All right, that's the end. Thank you.